<laughs> That's all right if you get wet. Oh my, oh gosh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, that brings back memories. Let me tell you a story. It's not my idea to farm the city. Okay, Scotty, let's start at the beginning. For thousands of years, a tribe of Indians known by the name of the Ais lived on this barrier island. However, they only lived here during the winter time because the mosquitoes, the Florida state bird, were so biting and vicious during the summer. Uh, Patrick John, that's your Irish humor. You know that the Florida state bird is the mockingbird. In 1513, only 21 years after Columbus sailed west from Spain, the Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon sailed past our coast and moved on in his epic voyage of discovery. The Indians and mosquitoes were sufficiently fierce that he and those who followed did not even attempt to settle this area. In this 1825 map made before Florida was a state, the eastern portion of Florida was called Mosquito County. The county was still a primitive area with very few inhabitants. Grandma, when did people start coming here? Oh, I believe it was back in the 1800s, Emily. Our barrier island remained almost entirely uninhabited until after the Civil War. Soon after the war ended, a few hardy souls from other parts of the country began to move into the Indian River region. Here are some facts about how this area grew. Cocoa was first settled by fishermen in the 1860s. Then, Confederate Colonel Henry Titus founded Titusville in 1867. Melbourne grew from a settlement established by three freed slaves about 1870. Melbourne Beach was founded by a retired Union general in 1883. Rockledge was the first community in Brevard to be incorporated in 1887. The first purchase of public land in our vicinity was by William Henry Gleason, a resident of Wisconsin. He visited this part of Florida in 1865 when he was commissioned by the U.S. government to determine if Florida could serve as a colony for freed slaves. He was so impressed with the area that he purchased 25 square miles, including some on this barrier island, from the state of Florida in 1871 for a dollar and a quarter per acre. He then moved his family to his new holdings and established the town of O'Galley. The next purchase of land in this area did not occur until 20 years later. Austin Lyman, a dentist, moved his family from Ohio to Melbourne in the 1880s and purchased from the government 158 acres around what is now Elwood and Roosevelt Avenues, again for a dollar and a quarter per acre. Mr. Lyman's purchase began a flurry of land buying. Buyers included a company chartered by the state to build canals to improve transportation and a couple of companies formed by railroad magnate Henry Flagler. The first indication that someone actually resided in this area is evident with a homestead deed signed by President McKinley during September 1898. That deed granted John Lyman, the son of Austin, 163 acres spanning roughly from Lake Shepherd in the Sea Park area to the ocean. Others, including John's brother Lewis, also obtained homestead deeds to tracts of land in the area. The present form of Satellite Beach started to take shape in the 1920s. In 1921, the first subdivision in this area was registered with Brevard County. That subdivision was O'Galley by the Sea forming the southeastern corner of Satellite Beach. Four years later, Alexander Good platted an 80-acre subdivision west of O'Galley by the Sea. He was a resident of Tillman, now part of Palm Bay, who made his living building boats and serving as captain on yachts. In this picture, he and his companions are standing with a bear killed on the island. 
Good's descendants are still prominent in Melbourne civic affairs. The next month, a dentist in Miami and a partner in California platted Gulfstream Beach. A few months later, the O'Galley Shores Company platted the O'Galley Shores subdivision west of Gulfstream Beach. William J. Creel, O'Galley's first doctor, was president of that company. These plats are still used in legal descriptions of land in the city today. Most of the street names are still familiar to area residents. Well, then when did they build their first homes then, Grandma? Well, Rachel, I'm getting there. Like many land dealings in Florida at that time, not much was done to turn the paper plot maps into real subdivisions. The only visible evidence of any of the early paper subdivisions were bulldozer paths through the scrub following the street layout of O'Galley Shores. Before the land speculation was over, land on the beaches was selling for as much as $2,300 per acre. That all came to an end after a 1926 hurricane devastated Miami and drove away land speculators. The country's economic condition then deteriorated until the crash of 1929. By 1933, the state owned more than 87% of the land in Brevard County because landowners had not paid their taxes. In 1935, the state held tax certificates on almost all of the land on this portion of the Barrier Island. The Florida Beaches Corporation was one of the survivors of the Depression. A principal in the company, if not the sole proprietor, was Vernon C. Fry, one of 12 men including Henry Ford, who founded the Ford Motor Company. The corporation had assembled several hundred acres of land on the Barrier Island in 1925. In 1947, the corporation sold the land to Martin and Leslie Lepp of Detroit, Michigan. Two months later, the Lepp sold a one-acre lot on the ocean to Louis G. Olson, an attorney living in O'Galley, and his wife, Ethel. In 1951, the Lepps, now residents of Florida, registered a plat for the Michigan Beach subdivision named in honor of their former home. So that's how it became Michigan Beach? Oh, that's right, Rachel. Uh -huh. Now let's meet some of the early settlers. The first person to build a permanent residence in the area north of the O'Galley Causeway and south of Patrick Air Force Base was a widow named Stephanie Snyth. Mrs. Snyth built her home in 1951 and over the next few years added several small rental cottages. She also rented spaces on our property where people could park camper trailers. Carlos Canova had a fishing pier in Canova Beach at the end of the O'Galley Causeway. And the Mathers family was operating its toll bridge over the Banana River on the west side of the island. Within a year, Louis Olson, who had partnered with the Leps in land transactions, built a small home on Cinnamon Drive near State Road A1A. His wife died about this time and he rented the house to a Mr. Castora, a draftsman working in O'Galley. The location of the house was so remote and lacking in utilities, even electric power, that Mr. Castora lit bonfires to guide visitors to his home when he was entertaining. Another employee working with Mr. Castora learned from him that lots were available on the beach. That individual was Tom McLean. He and his brother Harry built Harry's family a home on one of those lots. Scotty, we're now at the point where some of those who were involved in the growth of this city can provide us with first-hand memories of what occurred. These memories are not completely accurate in some small details, but a few scrambled details do not detract from this story at all. Grandma, did you ever know the McLeans? I surely did, Emily. They were among the first families to settle in Satellite Beach. There were not four or five families here at all when we come here. Well, I will say we are the children of Harry McLean, Jr., who, and we are the first children to live north of the O'Galley Causeway in this area of the beach. We moved to, to Florida from Pennsylvania in 1952. Uh, my father initially with uh, Zena and Ruthann followed my uncle Tom McLean down here, who followed his girlfriend down here uh, because her parents moved to uh, Miami. Um, 
we initially lived in the Indian Atlantic, um, and then uh, while we were living there, we, my father built the house, and bought some land from Mr. Olson, and built the house on Cinnamon Drive. And Mr. Olson lived on Cinnamon Drive, uh, across the street and up two or three lots from where we built. He also had two uh, coconut uh, lots on either side of the street with coconut trees. Eventually Tom built the house next door. They built a house for our grandparents across the street and that's how it all started. They were forming this first EE company and I don't know that that was space affiliated at that time. So that's why he came here to, because of the job. And then Daddy just followed him and it, it had nothing to do with the space program. Actually, the space program when we came here was not really not, not, not really going on that much. I moved here <clears throat> as I got out of service. Uh, I was with the Army out of Redstone Arsenal, Huntsville, Alabama. Came down here when we were firing Redstone missiles. Was going to stay with the group. This was the Von Braun team in uh, Huntsville. And uh, our work was going to be here in Florida. Uh, that meant finding a place to live here. I can no longer live in the barracks. I looked around Cape Canaveral, Cocoa Beach. That was too honky-tonky for me. So I got south of the, of the base here and found some area down here. And I don't know what pulled me into uh, Cinnamon Drive, it was just a little old Marl Street, and I met a guy standing out in front of the house down there, and his name was Louie. This was Louie Olson. So I've got a lot right here that I think would make a nice place for a house. How much do you want to spend on a house? I said, I only got about $10,000. He said, good. We'll build you a house for $10,000 on a handshake. Came down, and the house was ready to walk into. Talking to somebody else, I believe, why he moved up here. He said he came up here, looked at the beach, and saw all those rocks out there. He said nobody will ever want to live along a beach like this. And he bought this whole area. He wanted privacy away from that Miami stuff. That's the story I get from Louie. Now, whether it's all true or not, I don't know. You know, involved in lives, and he did a lot of good things, and he certainly got our family off to a good start with the support he gave our family. Uh, Tom McLean was next door to me. Louie was up on the end of the street. Uh, Reg Leonard had a house back where he, on, it was on another dirt road. Took a job uh, with Boeing on the Bomark program. And they, where I was working was right at the south end of Patrick Air Force Base. I managed to run into this fellow from uh, Michigan, him and his wife, they had all these lots. And I could have bought that whole block there for two, uh, $250 a piece, but I didn't have the money, unfortunately. Had some of my buddies, uh, mostly uh, electronic technicians, we built a house there on 400 Wilson Avenue, it's still sitting there. We came with two little girls and we lived in a trailer park down where the Purple Porpoise is and where Patsy Shell Shop was there and the uh, pier was there. While we were there, we decided to build a cabana and park our trailer on a lot and build a cabana and stay there. Apparently, somebody near, the, near where our lot was knew that we had bought the lot and he came and visited us at the trailer park and he said he would build a build us a house instead of the cabana on our lot, and that was Gaines Acoff. And while we were working on the house, Percy saw the house in progress. He came to see it, and he has, it bragged about he had just bought property all the way from the ocean to the river. And so we were quite interested in meeting our new neighbor. <laughs> My mother and father, they were uh, tobacco farmers. We thought as you grow up, you'd be a uh, tobacco farmer also. 16 years old, we could, they could quit school and go to Reynolds Tobacco Company for, and work and make money because they was tired of the farm. But farming was hard work. Per, person shine run a, a country store and they handled everything. And so uh, this guy come by and his rent house had uh, burnt down. First was such a good figurehead 
The guy said, they're wanting to charge me $3,000. First said, let me see your plans. And he says, uh, me and my two brothers will build it for you for $1,900. And right then is when we got started building. 1951, uh, we had one house, big house in Winston-Salem that we could not get the roof on or anything because it snowed, it sleeted and everything, and everybody said, why don't you go to Florida? And Jimmy Caldwell, here's where Jimmy Caldwell, our first cousin, comes in the picture. He, uh, he was a big race fan, and he says, uh, let's try that deal of going to Florida and uh, go in February when the race is at Daytona. And this is when they had the races on the beach, you know. So we spent uh, three nights at Daytona watching races and come to Miami and bought four lots backed up to each other in my mind. And we went back home and, and everything and finished that house that we had our trouble in. And in July, we took off to Miami of us, uh, three, bro three brothers. And so after two years, I came back to North Carolina and they stayed and built. And, and in 56, they uh, wanted a piece of land that they could build on. We made several trips up here, and we was informed down in uh, Miami where we were building, my brother and first cousin and I, that uh, we should be up here in Cape Canaveral. We had never heard of Cape Canaveral. That was in 1955. And it happened that we was having a Pepsi-Cola break, and our plumber was there, and he told us about the land that he owned at that time up here. And him and I flew up here the following day, and it was exactly where we wanted, and I bought it on the plane going back. So I guess it, uh, we might say that a Pepsi Cola was the cause of the satellite beach being born. I drove races for 32 years, and Jimmy called him one of the other builders. He said, bring the cars down from North Carolina and, and run O'Galley and Miami and places down here. And then my brother wanted to come, and I didn't want to, because I was driving race cars. NASCAR didn't have many races in Florida. So my brother asked me to come down and help him build his house. Then I could go back and drive race cars. Then I come down and stayed building his house. I liked it. So I've been here ever since. Dumont, he laid blocks for us there for a few houses and they bought some land and they become builders. Uh, Dumont and uh, Jack and Percy. Well, Percy was the ringleader of them and all. The Hitchcocks and Jimmy Cotto had all the lots. And eventually we bought a track of land and we developed our own lots, me and my brother Percy. Hamlin and Sherwood, those two streets all the way through. I sold my lots to Judah Primus so I could drive race cars. Another set of uh, brothers that came down, Ray and uh, Slim, Ray and Slim Sales, that came down and they done a lot of block laying for us and all, and they, they started building it. See, when we built Satellite Beach, Everybody worked on the houses, whether it's your house or my house or Purchase's house, whose it was. We work on it, and when we sell them, whoever that house belonged to got the profit off of it. Nobody paid nobody. It was all traded labor around the building. We didn't form no corporation or anything. We were just done everything by handshake. We were fortunate to everybody we dealt with. They said you couldn't. Uh, work like this and all, and I said, first and all of us said, why not and all of us, we're all good people and uh, they take our word for it and we'll take their word for it. Percy was one of the finest persons I ever knew. He always kept his word. He was a unique individual, he had relatively little education, but if he had a degree in anything, it was a degree of honesty. It was a family affair, completely. Everybody built here was one family. You know, we didn't have garbage service, so the garbage went out in the Palmetto, so we had watermelon vines and we had tomatoes that all came from the seeds from the garbage that we had thrown out. We had a real watermelon patch at one time. It was growing up so bad, you could have a house back in there, you couldn't find it, because there were no roads to get to it. You just had to have a pig path down through the field to get to it. There wasn't no streets or no road. But see, there wasn't even a street cut nowhere when Percy Hitchcock and them come here. 
Well, Cinnamon was, Cinnamon Drive was cut down two blocks. Well, until they, uh, you know, developed that uh, area on there where the school is, that uh, was a pretty wild country out there. And we had rattlesnakes all over the place. I mean, I had rattlesnake skins hanging all over the back wall of the house. Had a lot of rattlesnakes, too. And rattlesnakes everywhere you looked. <laughs> I never seen so many. A1A was a horrible road. Yes, it was paved, but oh, it was ruddy and uh, terrible. It was too lame. But back then, you could go up on A1A, and I usually pulled a little red wagon, and it was a red wagon, up the street, and you could just slowly look back this way and south that way, and probably never see a car except maybe construction uh, trucks. And boy, you dive under in the nice white sand. Who ever heard of, of a shark? No, porpoise maybe. And mullets jumping, oh my word, and porpoise. But never heard of shark, never.